Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining our Hangout. Um, we are talking today about autonomous vehicles and unmanned aircraft, and we have uh, a really exciting panel joining us. Um, with us, we have Dr. Wei Ding, who is an Associate Professor of Computer Science and Information Technology here at Florida Polytechnic University. We also have Dr. Dean Bushy, who is a Visiting Assistant Professor of Computer Science here at Florida Poly. And we have Kaushik Raghu, who is a senior systems engineer with Audi and has worked on their autonomous vehicle program. So thank you, all of you, uh, for joining us. Before we get started, I want to remind our viewers that they can ask uh, the panel questions live um, by typing in their question in the Google Hangout screen itself or by tweeting using the hashtag STEM Talks. So please ask us your questions as we talk about autonomous vehicles. Um, and before we kick things off, I want to get each of you to share just a little bit, just you know, 30, 45 seconds about your background and your experience in this field, um, starting with Dr. Bushy. Sure. I'm uh, thrilled to be here. Thank you very much. I'm a retired colonel from the U.S. Air Force. I've got extensive aviation background in seven different airplanes. The last airplane I flew for the last 10 years was unmanned uh, in the military, so it was an MQ-1 Predator. Uh, after spending several uh, years flying that, I went to to command headquarters, then back to the Air Force Academy where I stood up the first unmanned aircraft system center of excellence and training program. Um, after I retired, I went through various jobs and I'm very happy to be down here in Florida Polytech. Awesome, thank you. Um, and Kaushik, tell us a little bit about your background. Sure, Chris. Um, as you mentioned, I work at uh, the Audi's Electronic Research Laboratory. This is our facility in Silicon Valley. Um, I work on what we call piloted driving. I have teams of people that work on various self-driving capabilities for upcoming production Audis. Um, like Dr. Bushy, before my current role, I actually come from aviation as well. I spent five years working in uh, avionics and uh, various commercial aviation. And now I am glad to be working on self-driving cars. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And Dr. Ding, uh, tell us a little bit about your expertise. Sure. Yeah, uh, I have a uh, ten years, almost ten years, uh, uh, high education experience um, after my graduation in two thousand six, and uh, before that, I have a ten years industry experience, but not uh, unfortunately not on the uh, the, uh, the car or vehicle side. We are on the uh, several side, but one closest would be the uh, steel plant, but the automatic control. But my recent research is. Uh, very close to this area. We have in past few years, I have one project very much uh, related because uh, this automatic control cars in or in auto cars, smart cars, whatever you call it, are the uh, we put into bigger category, including the UAVs. And the, the Dr. Bushy uh, that was on that field was uh, we call it the, the new new coin. The name is called the cyber physical system. That's a the big automatic control uh, system. And uh, for that, we did a, a one project. We submitted a one million dollar uh, proposal in this May to the National Science Foundation, and that is about how to design this uh, the one way, new way to design the, this kind of a smart system. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Ding. And uh, as we get started, even in talking about your backgrounds, we've touched on a few different terms vehicles, we talked about autonomous vehicles, and I know there is some variation in autonomy um, in different levels, and, uh, and Dr. Bushy, maybe you could help explain um, that variation to help with our conversation. Sure, if we take a broad brush to talk about autonomy, whether it's uh, an autonomous airplane, an autonomous car, an autonomous surface ship, or an autonomous submarine, we can talk about various levels of autonomy, one being just a remotely operated vehicle or some sort of where there's a pilot or a driver helping an autonomous vehicle remotely operate. Then there can be a semi-autonomous vehicle where the pilot tells the airplane to take off and monitors it as it goes from waypoint to waypoint or car goes from city to city. The third level may be where there is more autonomy into the vehicle, where the vehicle is told to take off and it does its own thing to search for areas. It searches for a red car, or the driver or the car says, go to a certain city. It does its own automatic algorithms to figure out where to go. And the last level would be a fully autonomous vehicle that searches for a mission set and goes and does its own thing while a human just watches. So you're right, there's a various levels of autonomy, and we need to be careful about how we term it. I guess we are focused on the level four today, or? 
So, so I guess perhaps sometimes it depends on the in industry as well. I agree with Dr. Bashir that even in on the automotive side, there are various levels, and they and there's variations between how it is in Europe and how it is in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So there is uh, there is some difference in how we tackle. Um, however, I agree with the sentiment that, that automation is a broad subject and it covers uh, various types of automation. But yes, actually, is that a real uh, industry practice? Say in terms of level automation in the in the autonomous uh, car, I believe probably not so far. Um, thing in the car industry. I, I, so the the terminology comes from uh, agencies like SAE. SAE is a Society of Automobile Engineering. So they are are the European equivalent of this, or BAST, or sometimes from NHTSA, the National Highway Transport Safety. The administration. So there's various terminologies that come from um, various organizations, and perhaps the one that um, is of most interest for the, for the current, uh, for the immediate future, is what we would call a level three automation. So perhaps I hope that answers some of your question. That does. Thank you. And is level three automation that is getting closer and closer to fully automatic? Um, closer and closer is yes, yes. Great. Right. Got it. So. Um, obviously, this is a hot topic. That's why we're talking about it. Um, it's an emerging uh, part um, of the engineering field. Uh, maybe all of you can tell me a little bit about why. What is the advantage um, that autonomous or unmanned vehicles provide uh, that manned aircraft or manned cars don't? Um, and maybe, maybe starting with you, Dr. Bushy. Sure. Um there's several advantages. Let's just talk about the technological advantages. If you talk about, and I'll stay with aircraft. If you talk about an unmanned aircraft, well, then you've taken the man out of it, and so the vehicle can go to some remote austere locations, whether it be in the Arctic. It could go into dangerous situations like hunting a hurricane or looking at a tornado. They could also have long endurance, where you don't need a pilot on board, so the airplane can stay airborne for a long period of time. It also can carry very special sensors that can do various technological things to help different industries. And if you look at the economic impact, the unmanned vehicle can be much smaller and much more um, economically beneficial. So you can get the bigger bang for the buck. That's why industry is driving us forward to say unmanned vehicles because it's much cheaper to use as a delivery mechanism or as another technology mechanism. Thank you. And uh, Kashik, do you have anything to add in terms of autonomous vehicles? Why, you know, why is that such a, a hot topic? Why are we interested in having our cars drive themselves? Sometimes it's fun to drive. <laughs> True. So, so every year in the U.S., about 15 million cars are sold. 15 million new cars, I'm sorry, are sold. And, and when you look at uh, statistics from NHTSA, from the National Highway Transport Safety, um, over 90% of the car accidents are caused by human errors. And it is our belief that with uh, increased levels of automation, it's possible one day in the future to eliminate that 90% of human errors and minimize the number of accidents. I think that's the main benefit uh, automated driving brings to society. And you're right. Uh, one of our beliefs is when people want to drive, they can certainly drive their Audis, and, um, and it's a lot of fun. However, there are always going to be situations where, uh, for example, if you're on a traffic jam um, on a freeway on your commute to home, um, these are situations that uh, may not be of interest where it may be inconvenient for you to drive or perhaps you may feel that there's a better way you can spend your time. Uh, in these situations, I think uh, automated driving will play a big role in the future. Thanks. We are already starting to get some, some great questions coming in from our viewers. And again, if you have a question for the panel, you can type it into the Google Plus Hangout screen, or you can tweet using hashtag STEM Talks. Um, and already, uh, we have a question from Trey Paul Bay News, who wants to know, how soon can we expect to be able to buy a vehicle that drives us around? How close is this technology for consumers? Um, and I know that's at the top of everyone's mind, so, uh, so maybe we'll just start talking about that. Uh, Kashik, you sure. can here. Excellent question. Um, so when we talk about automated driving, we call it piloted driving. This is where we believe a driver has to be at the driver's seat. Uh, this is how a lot of the laws are written in the country in the U.S. as well and in other countries as well. So our uh, piloted driving technology, we think our first version of a vehicle that would have this capability would be the next Audi A8, and it should be out within the next five years. Honestly, I'm not sure when exactly it's going to be out as well, but we think that's the uh, window 
by when customers will be able to buy a vehicle with piloted capabilities. I'm going to chime in here. Um, what about the regulations that followed? I understand your safety aspect. I, I agree with you completely, but in the aviation industry, we have to worry about regulations that have to catch up the technology. I assume you have the same thing with the automobile, the self-driving car. Is that true? That is true, Dr. Bashir. That's a, it's very true. Um, and Audi has been involved, our parent company, the Volkswagen Group, has been involved actively with uh, various uh, regulators or regulating bodies in the U.S. to try to help, uh, I guess, us as a society understand um, as a whole what we need to do to make these things uh, safe and what we need to do to bring this to customers. And we're working through this. And we hope that the timeline for when we'd like to have this product on the road would coincide with the timeline when uh, all the regulations will be in place as well for customers to benefit from this technology. I believe like the, uh, the both Audi and the Google have the cars on the road for several years. So the, uh, the license actually has been given the companies. So That's the, right. They need to um, make a difference between the uh, consumer license own the, the uh, autonomous car license and say the, you only own the license. Yes, thank you for bringing this up. Uh, um, this is true. So the some states have uh, policies already in place to allow car manufacturers to test their uh, self-driving capabilities, I guess, in their states. Uh, Audi was the first company to get such a permit from the state of California. It was uh, earlier last year and was the second company, I think. This is the first car company to get a similar permit from the state of Nevada. So we conduct a lot of testing, various states and in various countries as well. And th these are uh, test permits that allow uh, manufacturers mainly to uh, test these vehicles on public roads. However, I, I, we don't know yet what the timeline is for such permits, or even if there is going to be such permit for a consumer use throughout the U.S. Is more on, you say, the uh, consumer licensing side or the car licensing side? Uh, not sure. Uh, I'm not sure if this has been resolved yet, Professor. I think these are some of the areas that, that we are still working on um, as a society and as a country. And we're, we're getting actually more and more questions. So everybody is, is loving this topic and a lot of the questions that are coming in are about safety which I know must be part of the testing process for any unmanned or um, autonomous vehicle so um, let's talk about that just a little bit you know what are the safety considerations when you're talking about putting an autonomous vehicle on the road even in the next five years could you just um, put it out on the freeway with manned vehicles would there be any safety concerns um, is there any um, you know, other concern around cybersecurity. I know we have a, a variety of expertise on the panel here, so um, maybe Dr. Ding or Dr. Bushy, if you guys can talk to the cybersecurity aspect when considering autonomous vehicles. Can, uh, uh, can I start with um, Dean? Yeah, let, let me start with uh, first. Uh, there's actually two things we need to uh, differentiate. One is a security, another is called a safety. It's actually a different thing for, for the, the people inside. Security is more on the the, the, the message about dealing with the people, the malicious people want to do something bad against say, the autonomous cars or the drivers. But the safety is more on about the system itself. With the system itself, or dealing with the environment, or the especially complicated situations like mini cars and the car, the, the accidental situations, well. But for I believe for the say for the safety side is more rely upon the uh, the graphical the the video, the camera processing, that, that part of the algorithm. For the cybersecurity side, it's quite more like other systems, like how do we do the prevention of intrusions. So let me, let me chime in on both those subjects. The, with the safety aspect, both the automobile industry and the aviation industry have rigorous safety standards that all manufacturers have to go through to say that an accident will occur at 10 to the minus 7th frequency. So as we go forward and produce these automatic vehicles, autonomous vehicles, depending on the level of autonomy, those same safety standards are going to have to be met to make sure that both the automotive and the aviation industry are satisfied that the public is safe. From the cybersecurity, and I'm going to just touch on it and maybe come back to it, um, there's two links. There's one that goes to the airplane that controls the airplane, and if somebody jumps on that link, they could take control of the airplane, so that is one concern. And the other one is the downlink. 
the sensor data that comes down or the GPS data that goes up. So there's several various concerns on links that go between, and I'm sure it's the same in a car, going to the but car. What I would say is those will go with a safety because if say, there's kind of a, like a problem system else, system, the problem comes from systems itself. It's not from, the say, the uh, adversary who want to attack you. Sure. The, yeah, maybe uh, Kashi has more input on, from you or your work, yeah. And there sure. Go ahead. Oh. Um, I agree with Dr. Bush when it gets to how uh, safety standards are established. Um, as someone who's worked in both industries, um, there's lots of uh, similarity between how we ensure these products are designed, designed to a very high safety standard. As, as an example, um, these cars that have capabilities have sensors with which they can perceive the environment. They have the ability to see. They use technologies like cameras to be able to see either other vehicles or, or lane markings on the road or pedestrians. And often there are redundant sensors. We have uh, two different types of sensors that uh, detect the same thing. So this is a, a redundancy that's built in two or more different types of sensors that can detect the same thing. So this is very similar in aviation as well. There are uh, multiple solutions. So G like GPS was one technology. There are other types of uh, radio receivers that are used to get position resolution in planes. Just like that in cars, there are multiple types of uh, cameras that are used to uh, detect objects. So that's one way. This is, this is no one answer. There's lots of different ways uh, how we ensure uh, safety. And re redundant sensors is one of those ways. So this was going to tie into to one of the questions that we got is what happens if your uh, what happens to your car um, if the grid goes down and it, this might be a good opportunity to talk about how autonomous or unmanned vehicles actually work. You're talking a little bit about the sensors. What are those sensors picking up? How does this technology actually work so that your vehicle can essentially drive itself? From is it by go down? You do, do do we mean like the uh, the uh, say that the, the gas is is is, uh, is almost gone, is almost run out? Or do we mean this scenario? I think so. I'm going to make some assumptions based on the question. I think that um, based on the question, what happens to your car if the grid goes down? There's some assumption that the car is relying uh, entirely on GPS, or that it's re relying entirely on a, a Wi-Fi network um, or something in order to operate. And if that goes away. Um, is there is there some uh, backup plan? And and so I, I think what would be helpful for the panel to address is, you know, are these vehicles entirely reliant on those kinds of networks? What are these sensors like? What are they picking up on in their environment that actually make the vehicle work? And what is the backup plan if that if that fails for some reason? I I believe the the both uh, Wi-Fi and the satellite may not be the the best one. I guess it, the, the, among these uh, the existing networks probably are the the cell network would be more reliable because they have a really big uh, coverage and not that much rely upon the, uh, the climate and weather change, probably. Then for if, say, the, so all the network go down, I guess we probably mostly rely upon the algorithm for dealing with uh, the graphical video. So the, uh, the camera and the processing algorithm would be the, the last line for the, for the, to just keep it safe. I believe so. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Bushy or Kashik, do you have anything to add? Please go ahead first. I'll jump in with the aviation in just a minute. Sure. Um, so at our company, we have various different types of projects ongoing on different types of automated driving. So some of them have no dependency on uh, Wi-Fi or cellular networks and things like those. Um, some may depend on GPS and there'll be some that have uh, no dependency on GPS either. So it perhaps sometimes it depends on the project and then it depends on what capability. As an example, uh, we would like to have cars that have improved ability to park by themselves. You know, someday we'd like to have a car where you know, you're at a grocery store and you just bought your groceries and you come back and there's cars parked next to each other and you can't open the doors. You just push a button on your remote or on your phone or something and the car just drives out by itself and then you can get inside. So that's a type of automation. So for this, you don't really depend on a Wi-Fi or on a GPS. So it, I guess it sometimes depends on what type of uh, capability we are speaking about, but 
I think the solution for some of this lies in uh, having redundancy. How do we come up with uh, methods where if one sensor is unable to provide the necessary data, how do we use a different sensor? And yes, that is uh, certainly something we do, and we have uh, capabilities where, let's say, there's a limited GPS for a few seconds or for a few moments in some of our projects, like where we have a race car go around a racetrack by, with no driver inside, um, and in that, of course, we had redundant systems that can handle such situations. Yeah, actually, that I yeah, actually I did some work on that side. It actually really depends on how how good we can translate, say, the the camera information into the the map the map database. If this mapping is this um, conversion or the mapping is very precise, actually, you can you can rely upon no network at all. You just use your existing the uh, the database the. the the two side actually database, the map database and the the, uh, the Google say the Google Earth the, the term is the, the street view. If these two you can do a very precise map mapping, then it's okay. But I guess so far it's probably very far away from that 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 uh, level. And then and from an aviation side, it's very similar. It depends on the capability and technology on board and about the level of autonomy we're talking about. If you're talking about a fully autonomous flight or fully autonomous vehicle driving around the roads. It's different than if it's semi-autonomous, but if, if you assume fully autonomous and the airplane does not hear from the operator in three seconds, five seconds, it loses GPS signal, the airplane typically has redundant systems on board that says, in the event this happens, the airplane will do X, Y, and Z. It will go to this point. It will proceed to its destination, um, and that's part of the public safety. It's, it has to be predictable to be safe. So. There are um, See. systems. There are systems in place in case the grid goes down or it doesn't hear from the pilot or operator. Say that that's for the, for the the aircraft of the case. See if say assume that all the network's gone, so we probably would only rely upon the uh, the cameras if they're for the complete the autonomous the, the aircraft. If if the the, the, the camera. The camera probably and the camera and the uh, the video processing or graphic processing algorithm would be you probably the last line of defense or uh, operation maybe. Um, I, I probably it depends, it, depends on, it depends on the level of op uh, of autonomy and it also depends on the operating. Yeah, 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 it's it's really autonomy, autonomy as you, you was yeah the highest level. Right. If it's it's, it's a fully autonomous vehicle, I, I would. I would think we would not operate strictly on a camera to maintain separation and avoidance in a congested area. But if you're in an area where it's non-populated and you're doing something in a remote area, yes, you can use the cameras to locate an object. You can use the camera to sense or a sensor to sense location. So it depends on the public level of safety, technology involved, and level of automation. The idea is actually without all other networks, that's the only thing the only input you have, you do not have any other input. Yeah, but that's a processor on board that already has instructions on what to do. So not only is it processing location via GPS, if you have GPS, it's locating via, and you're right, the other sensors. You not have GPS, the problem is. Yeah, the camera and other sensors. And it's not just video, too. It could be yeah. um, optical sensors. It could be electro-optical sensors. It could be... Sensing smell, it could be sensing chemicals. There's lots of sensors. Yeah, but, yeah, but uh, say the, for the navigation point, if say for certainly for the say internal control, we have a lot of other sensors like the sensor for the uh, the tank level, the sensor for the engine temperature, all that. Thing, but we are uh, we we'll probably will assume we are talking about the navigation. Any specific on the? Uh, I guess would uh, finally we have to burn down to the uh, the video algorithms. But sure. the, video is very, the video is a very important part of the navigation, but um, it's not primary. Speaking of algorithms, um, I think that this question uh, maybe may relate to the, the conversation here, and you guys will have to inform me. I was just looking at these and thinking how our viewers are incredibly smart. Um, so a question from Stefan Fella. Deep leaning techniques are showing very promising results in many domains, such as computer vision, NLP, etc. Are these techniques um, being used in current autonomous vehicles, and are they providing superior results than more traditional programming approaches? Um, you know, please, uh, please weigh in. Maybe Dr. Bushy, since we're on you, if you can weigh in on that that question. 
Sure. Um, there, there's a lot of um, deep learning techniques that are being employed right now, and that's part of the research arm of UAVs. What deep learning techniques can we apply to a variety of unmanned vehicles to make them safer? So, uh, but I'm going to turn that back over to maybe to Dr. Dang. Yeah, the, I would say the, yes. Uh, depending on how do you define the traditional programming, actually, there's so many programming. The empirical uh, uh, the, the, is a standard way to uh, the people uh, equal to the traditional programming. Yes, but in that term, uh, the yes, we probably for all these current existing algorithms, like for the graphical the identification, actually, the two kind of I believe from by Google research is two kind of thing algorithm we use most for the autonomous cars. One is the uh, the the graphical processing algorithm, which uh, uses the pro no mostly oh. the camera, the camera, several cameras on the car, then they're processing the all the images, and the, like the most time would be images, as a very short uh, time period, it's several millisecond images, then compare that with the database of the graphical database and the GPS database, and the provide the navigation and the specific operation. And another side of the algorithm is the for the uh, by the dean's term, the, the level of autonomy would be the highest level. That would be the more important. That is called the prediction algorithm. That predict like what would be the, the next say the next few seconds, the next one second, the next few seconds. That would be that actually not much from the sensing data, but it's more on the rely upon the existing database. But oh, oh, then also from the network. The network, like say, no matter we use the, uh, the uh, GPS, if we use a satellite, we use the, uh, the Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi problem uh, least uh, reliable or the, the, the cellular network. Thank you, Dr. Ding. Um, and we are getting more and more questions, which is really exciting. So viewers, if you have questions for our panel, again, you can tweet using hashtag STEM Talks, or you can type it directly into the Google Hangout screen. Um, Tacking a, a little bit onto this topic, so you know some of the, the things that we've referenced are current autonomous vehicles um, and what is out there. So from at John Connor through Twitter, he asks, typically when autonomous vehicles are discussed, UAVs and self-driving cars are at the helm of the discussion. Are there alternative areas of transportation where autonomous operation is already in effect on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, do you guys know? Yes, let me try to answer some of this question. So that's that's... Uh, certainly a very interesting question. So um, if you've been to London, they have, so London's got a very good uh, metro system, they call it Tube, and they have tube trains that don't have drivers, and this is not recent, this was like in the year 2000, they had uh, tube trains that did not have any drivers in the front and back, and that makes, uh, I think it makes perfect sense, but that's a good logical transition for that industry to look at not needing operators. Uh, similarly, I know there are people looking at using uh, shuttle buses and things like these on, on private property on their college campuses maybe, or, or resorts and things like those. So I'm aware that some of those industries are looking at some of these automated technologies. And uh, I think those are the first two that come to my mind. There's a couple that come to my mind also. You're exactly right. How about autonomous surface vehicles? Ships that are autonomously operated that can go for a long period of time. How about autonomous submarines that can go to deep depths to explore new worlds? Um, those are all autonomous vehicles that have various levels of autonomy that are very different domains. So it, it, across domains, autonomy applies. And, and right now, really get used in the everyday the practice would be those uh, uh, autonomy things inside the factory and the plants. I believe a lot of them already in used in use for a pretty long time. But uh, depending on how do you define a vehicle, they may be classified as a vehicle or not. Yeah. Like a simply line a long, long time ago. <laughs> yeah. And perhaps one of the other, uh, again, we talk about levels of automation. The, the mother of some of these technologies would be like the Mars rover that NASA has in, on Mars is a form of uh, automation. Um, Professor Bushy, perhaps this is a what you would consider a remotely operated or a, or a vehicle that is partially controlled by a human here in, in Florida, and uh, and then it does some parts of the automation. So that is a very prominent example of where uh, automation can enable some uh, miracles in society. Absolutely. Um, so maybe we can talk a little bit about what these autonomous vehicles uh, look like. Uh, how are they different? And I, I'm sure top of mind are, are cars for people. Um, you know, if we're talking about a fully autonomous car, 
does it have a steering wheel? Is there a TV screen on my dashboard? Can I totally kick back and, you know, watch surf the web while I'm on my way to work? What, what does it look like? What's different? Would I notice an autonomous vehicle on the road today if you put it out there? I think in some of these cases we are subject to um, some of these regulations and laws that are, that are yet to fall into place. And again, this changes based on some countries as well. Different countries have different rules and different states have different rules. Ideally, someday in the future, I think everybody would like to have something like what he just described, where um, you're in the car and you can do whatever you want. The car is just driving by itself, almost like a taxi. But um, that's a technology that, that is not here yet. And then that's probably what in the automotive world we'd consider at least a generation away which is roughly about 15 years or so. Um, there's there's lots of dependencies there. There may be some infrastructural dependencies, and they may have to there may have to be some laws that have to be changed, some important laws. And and our you know if you look at our roadways, our interstate systems, they're not designed particularly particularly to have uh, this type of technology. I guess technology is evolving very fast as well. But when you look at level three automation, that's what's uh, um, eminent in, in the automotive world at least. Um, we're looking at a driver on the driver's seat. So the driver has to be sitting on the driver's seat and then and I think SAE, the Society of Automotive Engineering, they call it uh, conditional automation. So there's gonna be a certain condition such as maybe you're on the freeway or you're on a specific type of road and then in that situation you can uh, push a button to engage uh, the, the, the you can call it the piloted mode maybe and then the car has the ability to drive by itself for a certain period of time now that gives you some free time to engage in other activities and we are not sure yet what these other activities mean I think some of these are being defined so we're yet to see what happens in the next couple of years I guess by appearance the most striking difference would be the camera on the top and <laughs> most pictures look like is that still like that for all these cars um, I think I'm not sure if you mean camera on top. I I suspect you mean these large uh, laser scanners on top, or yeah, they call it lidar. Yeah, we have a big top uh, mount stuff here on the top. Then I yeah. guess it looks like a camera. They have actually most of them has a several lens on side. <laughs> yeah. So again, it all depends on what level of automation we speak about. For what we are trying to bring to the market quickly, does not have that one specific type of sensor that is. is this is assumed to be the, uh, the highest level of the autonomy, so the, uh, it's no yes, we, at all Yeah, but it's very hard to predict how technology is going to be 10, 15 years from now. And maybe that technology that you're referring to may be replaced by something else that's smaller or more cost effective or more robust. So we're yet to see um, how this is going to evolve. But you're right that, that the ability to sense and the ability to observe, whether it's a radar or a camera, is going to be crucial to making sure that this comes to, uh, comes to life. Um, this is great. We, we have a, a question coming in from Twitter from Nathan Even. Um, which is, will tech companies ever partner with automakers to create autonomous vehicles? For example, would you ever see Apple with Audi or another tech company uh, with another auto manufacturer? And I'm going to tack on to this question because I actually had a question. We've been talking about all of this, and it sounds like there are multiple fields of engineering that are involved in considering autonomous vehicles. There's an element of computer engineering, obviously, um, industrial engineering, and I'm guessing maybe in the future maybe some civil engineering as we're changing the infrastructure. Um, so maybe you could talk about all of that. What kind of collaboration needs to take place across industries um, and what kind of fields uh, are, are involved in this effort? I'll, I'll jump in to start and then turn it over. It's, it, you're right. Uh, the unmanned system or unmanned vehicle is a system of systems. Just think about it. It is not an isolated computer science problem. It's not an isolated electrical engineering problem. It's a system of systems, and it brings together a bunch of disciplines from mathematics to management to electrical engineering to computer science to aerospace. So it, it is truly a system of systems that require a vast array of skills. I would say the uh, actually for by at least by say the National Science Foundation, they they are, they are, they think the most uh, closest or the most appropriate term would be a cyber physical system. They, but uh, this not only apply to autonomous car, also apply to say the the UAVs and uh, all others, the, like the uh, the smart grid and uh, say the uh, smart hospitals. All this, but uh, the the idea is precisely like uh, the uh, Dr. Bushi just mentioned the the how to integrate the, the big so many subsystem into one and make it function. 
the, the design part. And if uh, in terms of uh, uh, Crystal just mentioned the, the discipline, I believe would be the Besides the fancy term as a set of physical system, the the, uh, the academic side want to use the. If we go back to the general terms, like uh, the older uh, terminology, would be the control series. The control series probably most relevant. Then also the certainly AI artificial intelligence and all the sensing side. The sensing side, I do not know how do you uh, category uh, make put into category or put into the, the disciplines. Sensing probably would go with both either of them, but if we also go the more directly related one would be electrical engineering. So these are three, I would say. And I I agree with both of you. Um, I think with uh, driving automated driving technologies, there is a a, a new pattern. There is uh, a dependency on new capabilities that is not. A, perhaps some would consider traditionally automotive. So sensors, for example, are um, heavily reliant on camera-based systems. 20 years ago, cars didn't have cameras, or, or very, very few had cameras for very specific functions. Similarly, uh, processors uh, or GPUs, these are very, very powerful computers. These are going to be crucial, and this is sometimes regarded to be in the, in the computing world or the personal computing world or, or um, in the world of um, cell phones. And, and these things... Um, are now going to be a part of, of the automotive spectrum. That is the ability to process lots of data very, very quickly and in real time and be able to compute these uh, parameters based on what the camera can see or what other sensors can pick up. And then the car has to react very quickly. So yes, this is a blend of, of the different fields. There's, there's electronics. This is definitely uh, various types of software. It's, it's the word computer engineering by itself is, is changed over time, and there's so many categories within it. So yes, this this field does bring together lots of various disciplines. Yeah, actually, Kasi just mentioned actually his description just actually brought up. But actually, we can from this uh, description we add two more the buzzwords, which is the, uh, the big data and the Internet of Things. Actually, I, I've, uh, I guess Chris will ask uh, at the beginning of the, what's the impact of the, uh, the, the autonomous car. Uh, I would add one comment on, on that. Is besides all the, all the practical or the more direct, uh, the, the foreseeable the, the impact, the, there's a big impact with this, with this autonomous cars or autonomous uh, transportation. We can actually, with the, the new technology like Internet of Things, and combine all the three sides of the entire, say, economy together, like manufacturing, transportation, and the, consu the consumer side. Then with a cyber-physical system on the manufacturing side, with the autonomous car on the uh, transportation side, and with the supply chain on the uh, consumer side, we would have a complete the automatic system of our, almost all the, industry, all the sectors of the economy. It would be the, the bigger picture, but the, the better if we want to put something on the, uh, put a technical foundation on that would be the Internet of Things. Then the, the big data would be probably also would be a very helpful on uh, uh, that picture. I agree. I'm, I'm going to jump back in real quick. We, we've talked about command and control, control systems. We've talked about sensors. We've talked about information technologies. Aviation may bring a couple other unique ones. One would be the airframe itself, materials, composite materials and then a fuels technology. How, what is the power plant going to look like, and, and how can you get long endurance UAVs that can fly for more than 45 minutes on an electrical battery? And I'm sure the power, the, uh, power plant issue is a big one for the auto industry also. Um, we have a question from our Google Plus side, which is, I think is linking to this, um, and I love this question, representing the university, is what does the autonomous vehicle job market look like? It sounds like there are opportunities in a variety of fields to be a part of this effort. Um, what are you seeing as professors and as somebody who's working out there in the industry? Um, maybe Kashik, if, if you could chime in. What does the autonomous vehicle job market look like? I think this is going to grow in the coming years. Uh, we are in the early stages. I'm not sure. So I come from one company that has a certain interest. There's lots of other car companies, uh, some that are uh, very big in specific 
other parts of the country or in other countries for that matter. And I think this is going to uh, grow for everybody um, in the next in the course of the next five years. And I think if you're wondering what types of disciplines play a crucial role, uh, it's just what we talked about, I think, um, in, in electronics and software. Um, students pursuing fields in this area would be, um, it, it would be an obvious uh, area that they could look at if they're in these fields is to see how some of the things that they learn, especially in, in software and sensors and, and, and electronics, how um, they play a role in, in changing something this big. I mean, having cars that drive by themselves, is it's a science fiction. I mean, even as recent as 25 years ago or 15 years ago, it was still science fiction. Uh, there were movies where you had cars drive by themselves, and this is going to come out in, in shortly. So I think your students have uh, the right reason to be excited about this. And yes, I think this will be a growing market. Yeah, I would say for the. Uh, you, you, sorry, yeah. You first. Yeah, I was going to say, the, and with the aviation industry, obviously you have industry partners that like Boeing, Raytheon, General Atomics that actually produce these. Products and then the growth, uh, the potential growth and commercial impact of unmanned vehicles is is huge. It's in the billions of dollars. So the amount of money being invested by companies like Amazon, or Boeing, or Raytheon is going to drive a market towards jobs in this field. It's it's really exciting. That is really exciting. And and another question um, from Stefan Fella is: Does the university offer classes in GPU programming and deep learning? And I'll I'll answer this, and maybe professors, if you want to chime in, um, we have 19 cutting edge uh, concentrations and six degree programs at Florida Poly, including uh, computer engineering, computer science concentrations in big data analytics and machine intelligence and robotics. Um, so these are some of the areas that that fall into this field. Um, and professors, I don't know if you can talk about you know maybe some of the research that you're looking into doing or some of the projects that you guys are working on that you're most excited about that relate to this field, um, starting with Dr. Bushy. Sure. My, my interest in, in UAVs is exploring the possibility of cross domains. So whether it's in the agriculture industry, the energy in, uh, industry, the citrus industry here in Florida, is to find out how we can partner with the industry to, to solve problems that are existing today, whether it's the California wildfires or it's the pine beetle infestation in Colorado, how we can employ these vehicles or unmanned systems to solve real world problems. The other one would be multiple autonomous vehicles collaboratively operating, whether it's an unmanned car talking to an unmanned vehicle, talking to an unmanned submarine to collaboratively form a network to go out and solve exactly the problem. You said about the Internet of Things, the, the the machine talk to machine, that is the area of Internet of Things. And in terms of our poly term, I'm not sure of it. I We do not have the actual course yet. I would propose if to, to uh, Dr. Uh, the, uh, the Nasser probably for the have a graduate course next semester <laughs> for the Internet of Things. Then the most relevant uh, discipline of ours, like machine intelligence, computer engineering, then computer science depends on concentration. Yes, actually a lot of things in computer science. Yeah, artificial intelligence would be a great one. Then vision, what the uh, uh, computer vision would be another. So, so you had mentioned, I think, uh, deep learning a couple of times now already, and and uh, machine intelligence. So these are some very strong areas for uh, automated driving. Uh, especially with, with uh, image, with computer vision, like Professor mentioned. Um, these are a very new areas. Deep learning perhaps was not very popular five or ten years ago, but now there have been some developments in technology, both in hardware and in software side, that has enabled certain capabilities. And yes, as a car company, we certainly look into that, and we have people who work on that. And I think it's going to grow a lot more. I think the capabilities of, of machine intelligence and machine learning is going to grow very, very quickly. And I don't mean in 10 or 15 years, but more like a couple of years, this is going to grow tremendously. But yeah, as I, I would uh, add one more thing, like even though we mentioned so many disciplines here yeah, and the concentration, but yeah, the one actually the biggest thing is uh, the it's not how to make it even the smaller the, the field or the uh, the concentrations. The actually the how to we integrate them into one the functional the unity would be even more much more important in in this. As we said, yeah, the instead the system or system or the superphysical sub system, how to make the entire bigger system with a multidiscipline is actually much more important than the uh, we go into the the, the, the specific disciplines. 
Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I want to let viewers know that if you want to learn more about the programs at Florida Poly and the those 19 cutting-edge concentrations, you can um, go to our website, which is flpoly.org. Slash academics will take you right to the degree programs. Um, we have a few more minutes left in the session, and, uh, and we talked a little bit about the research, Dr. Bushy, that you're doing, and, and Dr. Ding, what you are interested in. Kashik, I wanted to give you um, a chance to tell us a little bit about your latest projects and what you're working on that you're most excited about. Sure, thank you. Um, so I think we have several things going on. If I could pick only one, I'd like to talk about uh, what we call a traffic jam pilot. This is a feature that we believe would be available in the next Audi A8. This would be the first self-driving capability that uh, we would have uh, available for customers in the US. Uh, this is where when you're on a freeway and you're stuck in a traffic jam, you, you sh the driver who has to be on the driver's seat can push a button and then the car begins to drive by itself. Now, th at this time the driver has the ability to focus on other activities whether um, and we yet to find out what types of activities would be allowed in which state and in which country. Some of these haven't been um, solved yet. But this would perhaps be our first uh, major capability that we'd like to bring to public. Now, outside of this, uh, we do have other very, very interesting uh, self-driving projects. Like there was a couple where we had uh, race cars race around the track, both in Germany as well as here in California. And we'd allow drivers to drive first, and then the car would beat them in time. So this is a very exciting project for us to learn more about uh, some of these technologies. We put these technologies through such complicated situations to see how they work. Of course, it's in a closed course, and it's in a very, very safe environment. But these are areas where we get to learn about these technologies and how they should operate. That is awesome. Um, we have so many questions coming in, and I know we aren't going to be able to get to all of them in the time that we have left, so I wanted to let our viewers know that we're going to post a blog later, and we will try to answer as many of the questions that we didn't get to in that space. You'll still get answers. Um, and I also wanted to ask our panel, if people are really interested in this topic, and it looks like they are, do you have any favorite sources of information, any place they could go to read or learn more, um, obviously, in addition to going to flpoly.org? Uh, where would you send folks, Dr. Bushy? Uh, that's a wide and varied question. Um, <laughs> there, there are so many sources. Uh, Go to your favorite subject. Get on Google. Google's an amazing thing. And if you type unmanned research, unmanned vehicles, unmanned aircraft in Google, you will find a plethora of information. Contact Florida Poly. We'll, we'll point you to the leading edge research. Contact your local industry. Find out what they're doing. I, I would send them out on their own quest rather than sending them to my favorite resources. Dr. Dang? Yeah, uh, for the uh, for those guys who want to really come into say the graduate school or come to the academic side, I, I, I recommend the, the the term I just mentioned, the cyber physical system. That is the uh, the uh, recommended by National Science Foundation. They they give money, but for the industry, actually, I'm not very sure how that like Audi or Google would go with Google with a Google I guess more like the terms like the data mining, art, uh, the artificial intelligence, or those things, or the machine intelligence, I guess. <laughs> So uh, with industry, I guess that's a tricky question. I'm not sure if there's one source where you can get a lot of information. Different companies choose to have different levels of public display of some of their capabilities, and it's fully understandable. And some companies are more uh, have more, uh, I guess, a, a, a broader public footprint, and some people don't. I know there are uh, going online and searching is perhaps a good way, and if some of your uh, listeners uh, use Reddit, there is a subreddit, a very popular one called Self-Driving Cars, where they track lots of current news in this topic. So this is one place where sometimes I go to learn what's going on in the industry as well. So that's some place where perhaps they can start. And your uh, this event is actually one of the trending topics on that subreddit. Oh, I uh, may add one more thing uh, for the for those like a party student, especially the graduate student. Actually, I'm actually uh, have a project I call it the uh, the Internet of Things, yeah, built on the the software defined network. I, I believe it's a very 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 relevant to this topic, uh, Thomas Cloud. But uh, we uh, we more on the say infrastructure side, uh, the uh, crystal dimension, the Internet of Things, and this combine all these uh, the manufacturer, the transportation, and the consumer together. That make that also enable the, the conversation between the cloud and the machines. Yeah. 
Thanks. If you are interested, please uh, give, give me, shoot me an email. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, like I said, um, you you can obviously go on your own quest, which I think is great advice, and explore your own interests in this topic. Um, you can go to flpoly.org and learn about some of our concentrations. Uh, we will be posting uh, answers to some of our leftover questions on a blog there as well. And if you want to find some archived episodes of STEM Talks, um, you can find them on our website. You can find them on YouTube. We're also on iTunes and SoundCloud. Um, we will be having two more sessions this fall, one in October and one in November, so please stay tuned for those. And I have one last question for the panel. You guys think you'll ever own an autonomous car? Hmm. Kashik, yeah. I bet I know your answer. Yes, indeed. Depends on the price, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you'd be surprised how autonomous your cars are already. I, I sometimes think my current car is very autonomous, so absolutely I will. Yeah, actually, a lot of cars already have, say, if you back up, the somebody, somebody is behind you, they will not do back up. They already have that inside, yeah, a lot of them. Great. And I think I will as well. If I could if I could, uh, could live that vision that I described before, where I'm kicking back on the freeway and tripping the web on my way to work, I will definitely own an autonomous car. For long-term, like, for long-distance driving, I definitely prefer that uh, I have a fully automatic car, so I can just sleep inside. <laughs> yeah, you can serve coffee, I'd be even happier. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so maybe in the next several decades we'll, we'll get there. Thank you guys very much for joining us, and thank you viewers for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you on the next one. Have a good night. Yeah, good night. Thank you.